Kia ora, welcome to Shared Lunch, brought to you by Sharesies in association with Business Desk. Before we get started with the podcast, it's important to remember investing involves a risk. You might lose the money you start with, and we recommend talking to a licensed financial advisor. We also recommend reading product disclosure documents before you invest in anything. Today we're joined by Felix Fock, a portfolio manager at Milford Asset Management, to answer the questions about what's coming next for the social tech titans. So welcome Felix, great to have you on. Good to be here, Dan. Are you a Spotify user? I used to be um, free riding on Spotify, but then somewhere along the line I, I switched out of it, saying, well, if there are certain songs I love hearing repeatedly, why not just, just buy them? Uh, for two dollars, whatever, on Apple Music. So I've actually gone off Spotify. I must be a rare breed. What are those seven songs? <laughs> if you had to name one, the least oh, embarrassing the, one. Oh, the price, the playlist. Uh, I'll show it you later, <laughs> <laughs> privately, <laughs> I think. <laughs> um, we're keen to talk about the tech sector, which has, um, you know, it's one of the biggest sectors on the S&P 500. It's been responsible for a huge amount of the stock market growth, and particularly in the period 2010 to 2021. Um, but there's some speculation that that golden age is coming to an end or at least slowing down. Goldman Sachs, chief uh, equity strategist, told the media this week that he thought technology was less likely to outperform other parts of the S&P 500 in the coming years than it has been. Um, he said, you know, revenue generated by tech giants has been compounding annually at 18% between 2010 and 2021, which is a pretty insane <laughs> compounding yeah. annual growth rate. So, so what do you think? These tech stocks have been huge. Yeah. They're slowing down now. Why are they slowing down? And can they ever resume that growth? That's what so I'm they're the fundamentals and then there's a stock valuation and stock performance. I think fundamentally, if you look at the last decade, we've had a big dividend from smartphones in people's pockets. Yeah. Cheaper and cheaper smartphones with better and better capabilities, enabling us to have an app for anything. Just leave it there. But that is effectively the dividend we've been receiving yeah. and has driven a lot of opportunities, some of which are economically unproven opportunities, but we clearly have benefited as consumers, right? all the way to the streaming, which I talked about last time I was on the show. Right? The ability to watch from anywhere, including your house on the move, uh, work, play, watch from anywhere. Yeah. So that's the fundamental aspect. Does that stop? Does that slow down? I guess there's a base comparison effect now that we do all have smartphones. What's next? Okay. So it comes down to an innovation question, and that's why, um, yeah, the future is uncertain, but all these companies are still investing a huge amount mm -hmm. on innovation. I can only expect that some of them will, will turn out to be meaningful. And, then, and if you translate that to share price performance, the sectors you refer to in the S&P, does that grow as a, as a mix within the S&P? I think what we are now clearly witnessing, especially as interest rates have risen, is that there has been a lot of investors allocating to this space. There's been a rush of capital into anything that is tech-enabled or if not actually a tech company. Um, so there's often a, a bit of a fine line there, but you know, a lot of companies claim to be tech companies, even if they're selling insurance, for example, which there are some examples there. So a lot of capital has gone in. Not all of them have proven to be economic. Um, some of that will have to come out. We're seeing that re-rating, this deflating of the, of the tech valuations right now. Because that's one of my questions is, a lot of the decline in 2022 has been because of those higher interest rates higher discounted cash flows, just lower valuations for these businesses. But, but are investors actually pricing in lower earnings in the future, or are they still expecting the same amount of earnings and just discounting them more because of higher interest rates? Yeah, it's a good question. So I think investors are now arguably just beginning to think about 2023 yeah, and how that is potentially looking like a weaker year, certainly in terms of top line growth. But are investors genuinely factoring lower growth over five years? Possibly, possibly not. So and there lies the problem. We have a range of investors in the marketplace, even amongst like professionals. Some are very sensitive to the next quarter, next year's this earnings trajectory. Some are trying to be longer term and think about what's going to happen in three to five years. And I don't think the crowd that thinks medium term have actually notch down the expectations. 
uh, whereas the shorter term, the faster moving money you have, have certainly flown out because they expect headwinds. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's really interesting. Um, do, do, do you have a house view on it when, when, when Milford thinks about the US tech sector? Is it expecting earnings to slow down in 2023 or? Oh, big question. And do we have a house view? Arguably not. It, it gets quite granular yeah. and it's up to the individual PMs and we have a range of PMs. Some are more conservative or value or dividend focus all the way to um, sort of more growth focus. So we leave that to the individual. Uh, but what is clear from a top-down perspective is that economies are broadly slowing. Uh, interest rates, to your point, is higher. So if your tech company happens to have debt, that's a negative. And there is another translation here is that the US dollar, as we talk about US tech companies, the US dollar has been a big headwind this year for US companies based in the US but selling internationally. So a lot of the cost base is based in the US, but you also receive revenues from in euros or sterling or Asian currencies. So if the US dollar was to just moderate or potentially weaken, a little bit like it has in the last couple of months, mm -hmm. that would change the complexion of the numbers that will be reported next year. So those are the variables. Okay, a few a few things to think about there. Um, Apple is, is one company that has done better than others. Um, some of the other ones are more advertising-based business. You know, Apple does a lot, a lot of hardware. Do you have a theory on why Apple is, is doing better than some others? So the most simple way is to, is to think about it in terms of barriers to replication or barriers to entry. So Apple has a brand that is not easily uh, replicated by a competitor. Um, and because of the hardware and the operating system that comes with it, um, it sort of locks you in. It's, it's hard to leave the Apple iOS ecosystem. Uh, and all the while, uh, you know, you benefit from the additional apps, to my point, the innovation around third-party apps that you can download and use, uh, along with Apple's own services like Apple Music, uh, so Apple is a little bit unique uh, amongst the, the large U.S. tech companies that people often think about because it's, it's actually quite integrated as a package yeah. uh, and it's very consumer-centric, which usually means more volatility. Mm -hmm. You know, facing consumers, you know, consumers are fickle. But in this case, the brand value, for example, let me illustrate. So Apple has been trying to work on a car project for some time. Okay. Uh, no products yet, and it's you know, notoriously secretive about the pipeline, but I would hazard to guess that if there was a product that will be launched relating to the car, it's probably going to sell out the first day, first hour for some time. And that is the power right, that Apple holds. And some of it translates to even a Tesla, if you think about Cybertruck, something that's cool. Right from from another company with brand power, but can you say the same thing about say Google or Amazon launching a, a product? Not necessarily. It's harder to translate that. So so Apple sits in my mind because of that uh, sort of extreme brand value. Yeah, that's a really interesting one to contrast against you know Meta slash Facebook because it feels like Facebook's brand has really taken a beating in recent years. Right. Um, social media in general has has. Um, become has really negative feelings about it for, for various different reasons um, from election interference Absolutely. to just like the bad vibes from spending your entire life staring at a screen um, is that something that you guys think about when you're thinking about investing in something like Facebook just you might look at the revenue but do you think about the brand damage that's going on or? oh absolutely yeah. absolutely so uh, everyone would have heard by now the Netflix documentary this, uh, the social dilemma, uh, which highlighted some of these issues. And look, to be fair to these social media companies, they've tried to respond to that and be better guardians. But ultimately, the fundamental incentives of an advertising business is to have as much of your attention as possible, even if that means keeping you on a viral loop, right? feeding you back the same thing that you've just watched uh, and then leading you down to these, uh, the, uh, these alleyways, <laughs> should we say. Um, so it's hard to say that is particularly healthy. Uh, look, I, but again, I don't want to tar the entire 
sort of company and all the user base is the same brush, some, some of them are genuinely discovering and learning new things um, because they have an interest, maybe it's playing a piano or instrument, all those things, uh, all the way to just following normal celebrities, just like normal media companies. So hard to say that's negative, but there's just some small corner of the user base um, that are getting stuck. Uh, and they may not, and those who are posting content may not be a bona fide you know, member of the community. So there's a point on the political interference. And how do these social media companies really stamp these out with, you know, in a bulletproof way, it's yet to be found. Uh, they talk about you know, content moderation, using machine learning to help, but none of it is sort of preemptive or foolproof. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting you say a lot of these social media companies, which we think about, we call them social media platforms, but in, in their heart, they are advertising businesses. That's where all the revenue comes from, Facebook in particular, but also also the other ones, Google, huge amount of its revenue is from advertising. Advertising is something, you know, I know from working in the media that tends to take a hit in a recession. People are buying less, so companies are advertising less to sell less products. Um, if we are heading for a recession scenario in New Zealand, but more importantly in the US, um, will that not hurt these companies? Companies earning significantly. What's what's kind of the re the recession outlook for for a social media advertising business? Yeah, so absolutely right. Advertising to a lot of businesses uh, will be a discretionary part of the cost base. So when they expect times are good or they're likely to be demand, they're likely to sort of accelerate that with advertising. And when the general macro picture turns out, the first thing you cut is probably advertising followed by maybe a travel those type of expenses. So that's true. But with that said, we're talking about digital online advertising businesses here, which is a subset of the entire advertising sector. And look, digital has been taking share from traditional media, including TV. That's so nice. there's a bit of offset there. Yeah, okay, interesting. So they, they potentially, cheaper ads, higher impact ads, they might be the ones that businesses want to keep rather than some more expensive or more traditional types of advertising. Yeah, just to add a little bit of meat around that particular concept. So search ads on Google, Bing even, those are intent-driven points in time for the consumer. It's like, I would like to buy something, something. Those are very high value, high return on investment for the advertisers. Whereas if the equivalent of billboard ads, but in a digital property, digital space. Those are general awareness. You want to build up the brand equity. You need to do that over time. So those tend to be the ones that get pulled back, which will, will naturally translate much more to the likes of Meta, Snap for Snapchat, or even Pinterest, uh, another platform there. Yeah. Snapchat's an interesting one because it's one of the smaller ones, and I feel like it was one of the first to give a profit warning to say that advertising is slowing down. Almost acted like a bit of a, a bit of a canary in the coal mine. Do, do you have any any views on on Snap and its future? Is it going to get? Uh, do the smaller ones get eaten first, and, and Facebook just by by sheer size is going to perform better? Yeah, I I have a view there. I mean, as I looked at the number of users, monthly active users, and let's take a industry metric of Snapchat, it's actually been growing. Okay. Um, it hasn't, I mean, there was a brief dip because the pandemic was a big boon for these companies. But by and large, the user base isn't in a, a massive decline. So that's a positive. Uh, and then you think about, is the platform differentiated? Well, actually, it's one of the more social uh, platforms of amongst the social media companies because, at least to start with, there was a big sort of, communication aspect between known sort of friends. Um, so that part of it probably does stay and have some staying power. Now, monetizing that is the sort of financial problem. And, and that's, to my point on display brand awareness ads, that's where it plays and potentially some direct online shopping experience. You can actually just click and effectively, you know, buying the item that's being shown to you. So I actually think it probably does survive, mm -hmm. but it's in the part of digital advertising that is more cyclical because it's about brand awareness. Mm -hmm. But in terms of um, users and 
the trends there it is not that negative, but you know, clearly the share price is taking a hit already. Yeah, yeah. It seems it seems to me like possibly what you're saying is that the the the, the de- declaration of the demise of the social media tech stock is a bit premature, and these companies are actually doing fine at the moment. It, it, would that be like a reasonable summary of, of what you're trying to say here? I think so. Yeah. I think so, especially as we as we move the conversation on to challenges like TikTok, you seemingly come from nowhere uh, five years ago. Um, you know, these advertising businesses like Snapchat, the, the sort of tier two ones, if I may call them that, mm-hmm. you know, their scale is not as big as the Googles and the Metas. Meta, for example, has about 100 billion US dollar in sales a year. These tier two players tend to have two, three, four, five billion dollars, US dollars uh, in annual sales. Um, there's going to be a, you know, effectively a lot of cost cutting that, that's going to go on and trying to balance the books, but I, I don't think um, they necessarily just disappear or, or lose users to the extent where they're no longer relevant. Mm-hmm. Interesting. I, I am just old enough to remember Bebo in MySpace, mm-hmm. uh, and my memory of it is Facebook coming in and just crushing it, wiping them off the internet. Do you think TikTok could do that to Facebook? So TikTok versus Facebook, ooh, that's, uh, that's a big mountain to climb for, for even a TikTok. Um, so Facebook has about 3 billion monthly active users. Um, that's the big share of the world. Um, to what extent does you know, a rise of competitor cause that many users to turn off and not log in, open the app of you know, the blue app, Facebook, Instagram, and even if you include WhatsApp, that's another uh, meta property. Um, hard to see it. Hard to see it having that dramatic of an impact. Uh, but, you know, take nothing away from TikTok. Uh, very fast growing and attacking a you know, short format uh, video clips market that you know, others are taking note and trying mm. to copy. Yeah, yeah, you, you really do see that it's having an impact because you've watched even even Twitter rush to put out short form videos um, sort of platform and, and Instagram is, is pushing it super hard. What was once a photograph platform is, is very fast becoming a video platform and many creators you see complaining, I get penalised if I don't post a, a, a 15 second video. So it is interesting, there does appear to be at least a threat there that they're responding to. Absolutely. Um, and if you think about creators and where they want to be, ultimately they want to be in front of as big as an audience as possible. Yeah. So to your point on Bebo, even MySpace, that was during a very um, early nascent phase of the development of social media. And I guess back then it was, it was a lot more possible for yeah. what was an incumbent to just disappear. A decade, decade and a half on, less likely. Yeah, I suppose those businesses are so much more established and have so much more capital and market position. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting. So the other th- trend I've noticed in social media, which is interesting, is, is a blurring of business models. Something like Netflix, which is a subscription service, is now offering some advertising. And something like Twitter, which has always been an advertising business, is trying to launch a subscription. Let's talk about that. Starting with Twitter, do you think Twitter can successfully sell subscriptions? Is that ever going to be a good business model for it? I know it's not listed anymore, but... It's a difficult one, right? You get accustomed to how certain things work and, and now they're effectively like putting up the paywall <laughs> right? to, to, yeah, 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 to exactly use a, right. a traditional media. Well, it's not traditional media, but a, a concept that everyone should be aware of. Um, It comes down to how much value is adding between the content creators on Twitter and those who use Twitter to say, you know, read the daily news or hear from certain experts that otherwise you would not hear easily uh, in traditional media. Uh, I think it's ultimately a avenue that's worth trying though. Mm -hmm. I don't know how far it would go because I've observed Twitter since it was listed almost a decade ago. Uh, And back then, Early on, there was people, investors were harboring hopes that it becomes more mainstream. It hasn't. Yeah. The number of users on Twitter is still around 200, 250 million globally, and it's been not necessarily growing that fast during that sort of decade period. Now that it's under new ownership, I just can't fault them for, for trying something. Uh, and maybe some of the 
um, sort of toxicity that people associate, you know, very random extreme comments and opinions people may have. Maybe, maybe that gets reined in a little bit when people have to sort of verify their accounts, right? Uh, this is more of a sense of you know, buying in and being a bona fide member of the community. Yeah. T tw Elon Musk's purchase of Twitter was, was one of the more corporate takeover, one of the more chaotic takeover offers <laughs> in history, arguably. Um, and then he, he it sort of timed very funnily when he first made the offer. He was, you know, paying a premium to the market price and the market went down so much by the time he finished actually completed the offer. So I guess my, my question is, do, do you think Elon Musk overpaid a little bit for Twitter? That's one of the easier questions then, I think. <laughs> uh, given he tried to wiggle his way out of it, uh, I would say, yeah, he much preferred to pay a, a lower price. And, you know, at the time of the closing, to your point, there is a gap, there's a time gap between making an offer, like any other corporate deals. Uh, there's certainly an argument for, oh, let's renegotiate and pay something lower. And again, you know, Twitter has a decent history as a listed company. I mean, it's traded between roughly $10 billion in market cap all the way to just below $40 billion and ultimately got taken private at $44 billion mm -hmm. US dollar. So, yeah, in that scheme of things, it's not completely outlandish, but it's definitely at the high end. It's plausible he could maybe earn his money back? Here's a funny thing. I thought a little bit about this and... Elon Musk is actually funding the equity part of the Twitter acquisition by selling Tesla shares. Mm -hmm. So whether ultimately, financially, this works out better or not, somewhat depends on what Tesla does, yeah. right? Because he could quite plausibly argue, oh, this was a diversification move. Didn't want to have all my eggs in the Tesla basket. Maybe, uh, you know, Twitter uh, can, can ultimately be, a, oh, I don't know, a portfolio play, diversifying some of that risk. Mm -hmm. Hard to know. But to my point, like Twitter clearly has a fan base. There's a reason that Twitter exists, and it's like some good communication, two-way communication going between like experts, content creators, and and those who who do use Twitter to get that information. Uh, how to monetize it ultimately is is the big uh, leap, uh, and you know as financial professionals, that's that's what we are sort of specializing or observe because. There's a lot of great tech that's been enabled by just the advancement in technology. Mm -hmm. How do we capture the value? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I tell you what, as a journalist, I'm highly addicted to Twitter, but but I'm not. Um, I'm not. I haven't bought a subscription or anything. But maybe maybe Musk could convince me to. We'll we'll have to wait and see. Um, yeah. Okay. Well. Well. Coming back. Coming back to the big question. Then I I, I guess. My big question was, you know, are, are we witnessing the beginning of, of an extended tech bear market and, and the end of the tech-driven bull market? And, and, and your thesis is probably not, or it's definitely too early to say. But I feel like a, a fair summary. So I think there has been a lot of excess, both in terms of capital chasing after technology and potentially also tech companies over-investing, right? Um, you know, we've talked about Meta, but, you know, one area is where they're investing a lot is pursuit of virtual reality, Metaverse, the next sort of internet. Um, that's one example. Another area where a lot of money is poured into, per my sort of previous chat with you, is in streaming content, yeah. right? Because some of these investments turn out to not be not economic and therefore should be reduced quite, quite possibly. But as and when they do do that, technology sector generally was going to show better profitability going forward. So I don't think um, it's anything too structural. I do think there has been an excess in allocation. Now, as it regards, could there be a different leadership group within the global share markets that would then take on the baton and be fast running going forward? I think if you look at this space at the moment, there are a couple of candidates. Mm -hmm. um, oddly, I think if you think about the rise of electric vehicles and the transition uh, towards a more uh, net zero or more climate friendly scenarios, then there's definitely going to be some investments mm -hmm. involved. You know, electric vehicle comes to mind, renewable energy comes to mind, but those are not big enough as parts of the market as is. They may compound to be bigger and therefore more market moving. Uh, I think that's yet to be seen, but that's definitely one area where the secular 
tailwinds will, will be blowing in its favor. Uh, another would be healthcare, uh, which sometimes trades like tech, because there's elements within healthcare that is about the leading edge, about novel drugs, novel treatments, right? Yeah. So healthcare has an element of technology advancement in there. And I would say healthcare is a pretty sure bet that we're all aging, we all will need more healthcare. Yeah. So those are the candidates, but it will ultimately come down to, in the short term, rebalancing some of the costs and investments for the tech companies, and then whether there will be genuine killer apps, yeah. you know, applications and combining that with innovation that's monetizable going mm -hmm. forward. Because some people would, would argue that in the same way we had the, you said the dividend from the cell phone, that decade of, of sort of, you know, productivity growth and, and new things to monetize, we could get the same thing from virtual reality, from headsets, from the metaverse. It could lead to a second, a second round of tech bull market. Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think about this often, right? It's like, to what extent was a big leap going from, you know, dial tone phones to having uh, feature phones and going from feature phones to smartphones, which then gives you the emails and the web browser. Those seems like much more so adjacent, natural evolution. For us to go from our smartphones then to full on headset, <laughs> Seems like a bigger leap, and I think that's why some some investors are quite skeptical on that. One thing that is interesting is um, dating apps. They've been very big. Um, is that going to continue? I think I read that that one third of marriages start on a dating app now, which is like an insane number. And whenever I think about the fact, you know, I, I like to have this daydream that the world is gonna become less digital, not more digital, and we're gonna spend more time interacting in person and reconnecting with nature, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But um, it seems like it's not going that way. Do you think that's a sign that, that more and more life is gonna go online and perhaps a bullish signal for things like the metaverse and Facebook that there's not gonna be a reversion towards non-online life, but that things are increasingly becoming online? Yeah, um, is it a wide-ranging lead there, <laughs> Dan? <laughs> uh, I think it's always going to be a mixture, mm -hmm. uh, the, the real world and online all the way to the virtual. Um, it does allow you to potentially bridge, uh, you know, distance, mm -hmm. um, the online world, the virtual world. I think that that's one of the biggest sort of advocating points to, to being online bridging the physical distance. But to your point, like marriages and relationship bonds, that, that's very central to the human wants. And yeah, that, that, should, be, that should be preserved, if not just a natural need. Um, so hard to completely see someone just living in the online world. Can you talk a little bit about what you know you and, and Milford are doing with your portfolio, thinking about the idea that there might be a recession in the US um, next year and, and there's sort of likely to be one here. Is, is that changing the way you're allocating capital? You're very active investors. Are you holding back some cash to invest in that time? Even ignoring stock, sector specifics, just your uh, investment philosophy in general. Are you deploying more or less cash at the moment? How are you kind of positioning for that possible outcome? Yeah, so, you know, Milford is, is now a big investment house with a range of products. Mm -hmm. Some products are much more f focused on the downside protection while capturing or growing investor wealth. Some products are much more plain, simple products that want to stay invested or stay much more invested because, you know, uh, it's, it's hard to have everyone completely uh, running the same strategy, that would be a risk, actually, uh, if we make that call wrong. But in the context of Milford, I mean, we have been conservative as a house and the cash position has been going higher. Mm -hmm. Currently, we, we see that having seen interest rates reprice higher, some of the corporate bonds of fixed income aspect of mm -hmm. the investment world is actually quite attractive. Uh, and for a conservative investor, that, that's increasingly more attractive than, say, cash on a look-forward basis. It somewhat depends on what inflation does. Yeah. But we certainly do see, um, having been defensive, we're now investing a little bit more, taking some of the risk 
uh, given valuations have come down across bonds and shares. Yeah. And the other thing I'm hearing from some portfolio managers is that they're liking bonds again because it feels like bonds traditionally defensive. You've got the you got the 60-40 portfolio. When your stocks go down, your bonds go up. We haven't had that over this downturn. Everything's gone down. Everything that is an asset has gone down. Uh, and it seems like some people are saying that, well, now the interest rates have maybe gotten near to where they're going to get, those bonds are going to become defensive again. And you're feeling more happy about including them in your portfolio. Do, do you think those that correlation is going to go away now? And then you know, if stocks fall again, bonds will go up in a recession. Other way around, are we kind of back to that that bond stock relationship being more normal now? Um, I think there's there's scope for that. Okay. There's definitely scope for that. Um, to some extent, it depends on what what the fear in the market is. In that moment in time, so if the fear in the market is for high inflation, um, well, you know, bonds don't do that well on the high inflation shares potentially, okay. But if the fear then becomes recession, yeah. right, yeah. bonds will do better, yeah. shares will not do as well. So what's the fear in the market at the moment? I mean, is it pivoting? Is it changing? Having seen, you know, a lot of uh, headlines running, you know, cost of living crisis. Are we then now going to talk about the economic downturn? Um, yeah, there's definitely scope for that, I think. Yeah, yeah. So more bonds going in the portfolio, potentially. I'm not sure if we have questions. We've got two questions. We're going to might, might throw to some questions. So we're using a slightly different setup today, team. So just bear with us. Oh, here we go. We've got a question from David Johnson. Going forward with big tech and big data, should there be more regulation around their rights to sell data for profit without individuals benefiting financially from releasing it? I feel like this country should stand up for data, tax profits. Okay, I'm going to summarize. You can probably see the question there, actually. But basically, should there be more regulation around big tech selling data? And I guess to tack on something, would that hurt their business model too much? It's a, it's a question which, um, yeah, Facebook, Mark Zuckerberg particularly, has been sort of uh, answering for some time uh, in front of uh, committees. It's, there's a trap here in the thinking, the mentality. It's these companies, if you ask, if you put them in front of the camera now, they will probably say um, they don't sell consumer data or privacy data. They anonymize them, they utilize them as part of measurement and targeting to make sure the ads are relevant and of some value, but they don't send that data outwards. So <clears throat> I've heard of like, uh, you know, thought leaders here, it's, 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 a, it's a slightly nuance. Now, I don't want to dismiss the question just because there's a nuance there, mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, these companies, arguably, if they are completely walled off and they're not, uh, you know, leaking that personal data outwards or not anymore, <laughs> maybe not they've done anymore. so in the past, <laughs> then, then they, they have sort of a, a line of defense there. Uh, what regulations clearly has been pushing towards is giving the consumer the choice to know what data you're giving out. Do you want to give that data out and the right to erase that data to be forgotten. Um, so that aspect is a no-brainer, I think. Yeah, consumers that should all have pop-ups now. You know, do you want um, this iOS or this app to be collecting your data? Do you want to be tracked? And you know, the default possibly is no. Because that's one of the things that really hurt Facebook's share price was that Apple put in its tracking optional um, feature where you can say, ask this app not to track, and you can get Facebook not to track. But I mean, it hasn't destroyed Facebook's revenue at all. Facebook does fine still, um, maybe it's a headwind, but it's, it's not a, um, hasn't destroyed the business model. No, and that's arguably because previously they had such a great transparency uh, in terms of, okay, you've seen an ad, what's the subsequent action, what's the purchase at this you know, store? So previously they had, my understanding is they had like great look through mm -hmm. Uh, and now they have less great load through and relying on more probability uh, guesses as to whether that ad has had an impact on sales. And that actually even, evens out their playing field a little bit between uh, a meta and the other social media apps. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and, and last question, we did talk about this a little bit, maybe you could just touch on your view again. Um, there's a lot of talk about the metaverse and VR. How important do you really think it, it could be? Would you invest in the metaverse? So that's actually an easier one to, yeah, yeah, to answer. Let's go there. It, the promise is so big yeah. that as an investor, it will be wrong to not invest or research into it. Now, it's a long way to go between um, now and what's been prophesized, if you like, yeah. by sci-fi yeah. uh, and, you know, the, the, the famous book, I think, Snow Crash, that uh, people refer to. Uh, it's, uh, it's like a lot of things. I believe it takes time, it's a transition, it's a hybrid. It's very, very difficult for the consumer, for society to jump, to leap. It's very difficult to leap. Um, so there's a so there's certain proto metaverse options out there. And look, uh, those who, who follow what I say is like, they, they may know that I'm a big fan of simulations. Mm -hmm. So there's another word for simulations, that's games. Yeah. So <laughs> I often see the two things as effectively proto, you know, metaverse, uh, and look, you know, uh, meta at reality labs, all the way to uh, Microsoft with HoloLens, not necessarily games, but more for business use, all the way to say Roblox, which is a game platform, but talks about immersive experiences. Those are sort of potentially early precursors. I, I do think from uh, the share market standpoint, the metaverse plays have probably been tagged negatively by the blow-ups we're seeing in cryptocurrencies. I think to su at some level, people tie crypto, NFTs, metaverse together, and it's somewhat true because there are projects working on how to sort of leverage uh, blockchain and unique tokens in a metaverse virtual world context. Uh, and I think you know, crypto blowing up doesn't help the sentiment on metaverse plays. Uh, but put all of that aside and thinking more five years, possibly 10 years, um, I think the investments will be there, the desire to poke to see whether this works will be there. And um, the key is to stick with players who's got the financial resources um, to sort of make that happen. Yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting take. The, the opportunity is so big that you want to be interested just in case it does work. Okay, that's really good. Hey, we're, we're running out of time. Any, any parting thoughts, words of wisdom you want to share? Well, I think ups and downs for investing. Um, yeah, it's a difficult year, possibly still a difficult period. Uh, there's some clear headwinds, not least from inflation interest rates, policymakers uh, who, who are a little aware and overly worried by potentially inflation staying high for a long time. So it's not particularly a good backdrop for risky assets. But with that said, uh, you know, if this period turns out to be the second so dot com burst, dot com bubble burst, well then look at what happened the first time around. The survivors those who go on and keep their human capital and continue to invest with innovation ultimately, you know, got rewarded. So same here. Uh, if this is the second dot-com crash, look out for, for those who are still standing, uh, investing and hiring talent uh, in the next year or so. Those are the ones that will charge on. Okay, brilliant. Uh, thank, you tune thank you for tuning in, everyone, and big thank you, Felix, for joining us. We really appreciate your time and insights. As always, becoming a bit of a friend of the show with your second appearance. We'll have to have you back on again. Uh, Shared Lunch will be back next week, but this was our last live webinar of the year. Our next podcast is uh, audio uh, podcast only, and it's exclusive looking back at the year that was. It's a 2022 review with Brooke and Leighton Roberts, the two of the CEOs of Sharesies, and Brad Olson, another friend of the show and principal economist at Infometrics. Make sure you get that sent. You can follow the link to subscribe on our podcast. It's in the chat now. Um, enjoy the rest of your week and stay safe.